What? Shall we have incision? Shall we embrew? Henry the Fourth. Old Sir Guy of Gamwell, and young William Gamwell, and fair Alice Gamwell, and Sir Ralph Montfaucon and his squire, rode together the next morning to the scene of the feast. They arrived on a village green, surrounded with cottages peeping from among the trees by which the green was completely encircled. The whole circle was hung round with one continuous garland of flowers, depending in irregular festoons from the branches. In the center of the green was a maypole hidden in boughs and garlands, and a multitude of round-faced bumpkins and cherry-check lasses were dancing around it, to the quadruple melody of scrape-squeak, whistle-rap, trump-twang, and muggle-drone, harmony we must not call it, for, though they had agreed to a partnership in point of tune, each, like a true painstaking man, seemed determined to have his time to himself. Muggledrone played Allegretto, Trump twang Allegro, Whistle Rap Presto, and Scrape Squeak Prestissimo. There was a kind of mathematical proportion in their discrepancy, while Muggledrone played the tune four times, Trump twang played it five, Whistle Rap six, and Scrape Squeak eight, for the latter completely distanced all his competitors, and indeed worked his elbow so nimbly that its outline was scarcely distinguishable through the mistiness of its rapid vibration. While the knight was delighting his eyes and ears with these pleasant sights and sounds, all eyes were turned in one direction, and Sir Ralph, looking round, saw a fair lady in green and gold come riding through the trees, accompanied by a portly friar in grey, and several fair damsels in gallant grooms. On their nearer approach, he recognized the Lady Matilda and her ghostly adviser, Brother Michael. A party of foresters arrived from another direction, and then ensued cordial interchanges of greeting and collisions of hands and lips among the Gamwells and the newcomers. How does my fair cuz, Maud, and how does my sweet cuz, Maud, and how does my wild cuz, Maud? And a eh? jolly friar, your hand, old boy, and here, honest friar, and to me, merry friar, and by your favor, Mistress Alice, and hey, cousin Robin, and hey. Cousin Will and Odie's life. Mary Sir Guy, you grow younger every year, as the old knight shook them all in turn with one hand, and slapped them on the back with the other, in token of his affection. A number of young men and women advanced, some drawing, and others dancing round, a floral car, and having placed a crown of flowers on Matilda's head, they saluted her Queen of the May, and drew her to the place appointed for the rural sports. A hogshead of ale was a brooch under an oak, and a fire was blazing in an open space before the trees to roast the fat deer which the foresters brought. The sports commenced, and, after an agreeable series of bowling, coiling, pitching, hurling, racing, leaping, grinning, wrestling or friendly dislocation of joints, and cudgel playing or amicable cracking of skulls, the trial of archery ensued. The conqueror was to be rewarded with a golden arrow from the hand of the Queen of the May who was to be his partner in the dance till the close of the feast. This stimulated the knight's emulation, young Gamwell supplied him with a bow and arrow, and he took his station among the foresters, but had the mortification to be outshot by them all, and to see one of them lodge the point of his arrow in the golden ring of the center, and received the prize from the hand of the beautiful Matilda, who smiled on him with particular grace. The jealous knight scrutinized the successful champion with great attention, and surely thought he had seen that face before. In the meantime the forester led the lady to the station. The luckless Sir Ralph drank deep draughts of love from the matchless grace of her attitudes, as, taking the bow in her left hand, and adjusting the arrow with her right, advancing her left foot, and gently curving her beautiful figure with a slight motion of her head that waved her black feathers and her ringlet hair, she drew the arrow to its head, and loosed it from her open fingers. The arrow struck within the ring of gold, so close to that of the victorious forester that the points were in contact, and the feathers were intermingled. Great acclamations succeeded, and the forester led Matilda to the dance. Sir Ralph gazed on her fascinating motions till the torments of baffled love and jealous rage became unendurable, and approaching young Gamwell, he asked him if he knew the name of that forester who was leading the dance with the Queen of the May? Robin, I believe, said young Gamwell carelessly, I think they call him Robin. Is that all you know of him? said Sir Ralph. What more should I know of him? said young Gamwell. Then I can tell you, said Sir Ralph, 
he is the outlawed Earl of Huntingdon, on whose head is set so large a price. I is he, said young Gamwell, in the same careless manner. He were a prize worth the taking, said Sir Ralph. No doubt, said young Gamwell. How think you, said Sir Ralph, are the foresters his adherents? I cannot say, said young Gamwell. Is your peasantry loyal and well disposed, said Sir Ralph? Passing loyal, said young Gamwell. If I should call on them in the king's name, said Sir Ralph, think you they would aid and assist? Most likely they would, said young Gamwell, one side or the other. I. But which side, said the knight. That remains to be tried, said young Gamwell. I have King Henry's commission, said the knight, to apprehend this earl that was. How would you advise me to act, being, as you see, without attendant force? I would advise you, said young Gamwell, to take yourself off without delay, unless you would relish the taste of a volley of arrows, a shower of stones, and a hailstorm of cudgel blows, which would not be turned aside by a god save King Henry. Sir Ralph's squire no sooner heard this, and saw by the looks of the speaker that he was not likely to prove a false prophet, than he clapped spurs to his horse and galloped off with might and main. This gave the knight a good excuse to pursue him, which he did with great celerity, calling, Stop, you rascal! When the squire fancied himself safe out of the reach of pursuit, he checked his speed, and allowed the knight to come up with him. They rode on several miles in silence, till they discovered the towers and spires of Nottingham, where the knight introduced himself to the sheriff, and demanded an armed force to assist in the apprehension of the outlawed Earl of Huntingdon. The sheriff, who was willing to have his share of the prize, determined to accompany the knight in person, and regaled him and his man with good store of the best, after which, they, with a stout retinue of fifty men, took the way to Gamwell Feast. God's my life, said the sheriff, as they rode along, I had as lief you would tell me of a service of plate. I much doubt if this outlawed earl, this forester Robin, be not the man they call Robin Hood, who has quartered himself in Sherwood Forest, and whom in endeavoring to apprehend I have fallen divers times into disasters. He has gotten together a band of disinherited prodigals, outlawed debtors, excommunicated heretics, elder sons that have spent all they had, and younger sons that never had anything to spend and with these he kills the king's deer, and plunders wealthy travellers of five-sixths of their money, but if they be abbots or bishops, then he despoils utterly. The sheriff then proceeded to relate to his companion the adventure of the abbot of Double Flask, which some grave historians have related of the abbot of St. Mary's, and others of the bishop of Hereford how the abbot, returning to his abbey in company with his high sealer, who carried in his portmanteau the rents of the abbey lands, and with a numerous train of attendants, came upon four seeming peasants, who were roasting the king's venison by the king's highway, how, in just indignation. At this flagrant infringement of the forest laws, he asked them what they meant, and they answered that they meant to dine, how he ordered them to be seized and bound, and led captive to Nottingham, that they might know wild flesh to have been destined by providence for licensed and privileged appetites, and not for the base hunger of unqualified knaves, how they prayed for mercy, and how the abbot swore by St. Charity that he would show them none, how one of them thereupon drew a bugle horn. From under his smockfrock and blew three blasts, on which the abbot and his train were instantly surrounded by sixty bowmen in green, how they tied him to a tree, and made him say mass for their sins, how they unbound him, and sate him down with them to dinner, and gave him venison and wild fowl and wine, and made him pay for his fare all the money in his high sealer's portmanteau, and enforced him to sleep all night under a tree in his cloak, and to leave the cloak behind him in the morning. How the abbot, light in pocket and heavy in heart, raised the country upon Robin Hood, for so he had heard the chief forester called by his men, and hunted him into an old woman's cottage, how Robin changed dresses with the old woman, and how the abbot rode in great triumph to Nottingham, having in custody an old woman in a green doublet and breeches, how the old woman discovered herself, how the merrymen of Nottingham laughed at the abbot, how the abbot railed at the old woman, and how the old woman outrailed the abbot, telling him that Robin had given her food and fire through the winter, which no abbot would ever do, 
but would rather take it from her for what he called the good of the church, by which he meant his own laziness and gluttony, and that she knew a true man from a false thief, and a free forester from a greedy abbot. Thus you see, added the sheriff, how this villain perverts the deluded people by making them believe that those who tithe and toll upon them for their spiritual and temporal benefit are not their best friends and fatherly guardians, for he holds that in giving to boors and old women what he takes from priests and peers, he does but restore to the former what the latter had taken from them, and this the impudent varlet calls distributive justice. Judge now if any loyal subject can be safe in such neighborhood. While the sheriff was thus enlightening his companion concerning the offenders, and wetting his own indignation against them, the sun was fast sinking to the west. They rode on till they came in view of a bridge, which they saw a party approaching from the opposite side, and the knight presently discovered that the party consisted of the Lady Matilda and Friar Michael, young Gamwell, cousin Robin, and about half a dozen foresters. The knight pointed out the earl to the sheriff, who exclaimed, Here, then, we have him an easy prey, and they rode on manfully towards the bridge, on which the other party made halt. Who be these, said the friar, that come riding so fast this way? Now, as God shall judge me, it is that false knight Sir Ralph Montfaucon, and the sheriff of Nottingham, with a posse of men. We must make good our post, and let them dislodge us if they may. The two parties were now near enough to parley, and the sheriff and the knight, advancing in the front of the cavalcade, called on the lady, the friar, young Gamwell, and the foresters, to deliver up that false traitor, Robert, formerly Earl of Huntingdon. Robert himself made answer by letting fly an arrow that struck the ground between the four feet of the sheriff's horse. The horse reared up from the whizzing and lodged the sheriff in the dust, and, at the same time, the fair Matilda favored the knight with an arrow in his right arm that compelled him to withdraw from the affray. His men lifted the sheriff carefully up and replaced him on his horse, whom he immediately with great rage and zeal urged on to the assault with his fifty men at his heels, some of whom were intercepted in their advance by the arrows of the foresters and Matilda, while the friar, with an eight-foot staff, dislodged the sheriff a second time and laid on him with all the vigor of the church militant on earth, in spite of his ejaculations of, Hey, Friar Michael! What means this, honest friar? Hold, ghostly friar! Hold, holy friar! Till Matilda interposed, and delivered the battered sheriff to the care of the foresters. The friar continued flourishing his staff among the sheriff's men, knocking down one, breaking the ribs of another, dislocating the shoulder of a third, flattening the nose of a fourth, cracking the skull of a fifth, and pitching a sixth into the river, till the few, who were lucky enough to escape with whole bones, clapped spurs to their horses and fled for their lives, under a farewell volley of arrows. Sir Ralph Squire, meanwhile, was glad of the excuse of attending his master's wound to absent himself from the battle, and put the poor knight to a great deal of unnecessary pain by making as long a business as possible of extracting the arrow, which he had not accomplished when Matilda, approaching, extracted it with great facility, and bound up the wound with her scarf, saying, I reclaim my arrow, Sir Knight, which struck where I aimed it, to admonish you to desist from your enterprise. I could as easily have lodged it in your heart. It did not need, said the knight, with rueful gallantry, you have lodged one there already. If you mean to say that you love me, said Matilda, it is more than I ever shall you, but if you will show your love by no further interfering with mine, you will at least merit my gratitude. The knight made a wry face under the double pain of heart and body caused at the same moment by the material or martial, and the metaphorical or erotic arrow, of which the latter was thus barbed by a declaration more candid than flattering, but he did not choose to put in any such claim to the lady's gratitude as would bar all hopes of her love, he therefore remained silent, and the lady in her escort, leaving him and the sheriff to the care of the squire, rode on till they came in sight of Arlingford Castle, when they parted in several directions. The friar rode off alone, and after the foresters had lost sight of him they heard his voice through the twilight, singing, A staff, a staff, of a young oak graff, that is both stir and stiff, is all a good friar can needs desire to shrive a proud sheriff. And now, fine fellow, who hast tasted so of the foresters' greenwood game, wilt be in no haste thy time to waste in seeking more taste of the same, or this can I rid thee, and riddle thee well, 
Thou hadst better by far be the devil in hell than the sheriff of Nottingham.